so I'm delighted to be here with all of you today and we have the Gaur Purnima festival coming in just about 36 hours now so we will discuss about the glories of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu I think you may have to get this ahead yeah. you cannot see it isn't it yes we'll do that mm -hmm. Or maybe can we keep it here? Okay. Can you keep the wire behind? Otherwise, a simple thing. Wait a minute. Well, what we could do is, I could just sit there. No, no, no. I could sit here. That might be easy. That might be easy. I can just sit here. Yeah. And I think I can use that chair. That chair. No, no, no. This is too. Too comfortable to be comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> no, I prefer something harder, not so. Because I'll sink in while I'm writing. You just take that chest. Can you just move this away? So, we will discuss today about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and some aspects of his descent. So, I hope that all of you by the end of this class will become IIT graduates. <laughs> so we'll discuss three things. The identity of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, his intention, his mission, and then the transformation that he inspires in our hearts. So there's a beautiful song about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. We will recite some verses from that song and then we will move forward. So this is Yajite Haripada Saroj Sudha The Bhakti Nath Thakur Godrum Chandra Bhajana Updesh So Godrum Chandra is Yajitane Mahaprabhu Bhajana Updesh So it's an interesting concept that There is Bhajan, it's more a song But through the Bhajan, Updesh is being given uh, Instruction is given There are many verses in this We won't be able to do all the verses But we'll look at some of them So, what is his identity that is described in this particular verse, who he is? So, I will explain each line and we will decide that line and then we will decide the verse together. First we will decide the verse responsibly, then together. Then we will discuss something on the verse and then we will decide the verse again. So, avatar varam paripurna phalam. So, he is the avatar varam. He is the essence of all avatars. He is Paripurna Phalam. So he is the highest manifestation, the ultimate reality. Paripur. So what he is giving, who he is and what he is giving. That is Paripurna. That is complete. <coughs> Avatar Varam Paripurna Phalam. Avatar Varam Paripurna Phalam. Uh, we'll do it twice to responsibly and then once collectively. Prabhu, I have a tune for this. Oh, you okay? have? Yeah, but please. Avatar Varam Paripurna Phalam Paratatma Mihatma Vilasamayam. Can you do one line at time? Okay. Avatar Varam Paripurna Phalam Paratatma Mihatma Vilasamayam. Avatar Varam Paripurna Phalam Paratatma Mihatma Vilasamayam. Wait a minute. So one line, okay. we will just recite it. Okay. And then we will, I'll just explain the meaning, then we'll go to the next line. Okay. So one line twice we'll do and then two will twice will recite responsibly and then once collectively. Okay. So you can just do once more of this second, second line, first line only. Together now. Okay then. So Paratatva. So he is not just the best of the avatars here when he descends he is himself the highest reality paratattva and then ihatma vilasamayam so iha what is he doing in this world then atma vilas so his own personal pastimes so vilas is joyful <coughs> pastimes atma here is self atma vilasamayam so he is filled with his mayam means full of he is full of he is rich enriched with he is manifesting fully 
is personal past tense in the spiritual world paratat ya now so what is his atma vilas about let's describe what is his delighting in that vraja dham so vraja dham is the abode of vrindavan and there that is like an ocean of rasa of divine emotion rasa ambudi and even in that ocean there is gupta rasam there is something which is confidential so very secret past time very intimate experience of love is there so that is what he is both savoring himself and he is sharing with others that sharing part will come but here is manifesting those past times with those most intimate or confidential emotions yes rajadama rasam budi gupta rasam 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 bhaj godruma kanan so godrum is one of the nine rooms the nine dwipas of vrindavan vrindavan mayapur mayapur yes <laughs> so sometimes i'll commit an intentional mistake and sometimes an unintentional mistake and either way if you don't detect it that's a mistake <laughs> <laughs> so bhaj godruma kanan so kanan is the forest the forest of godrum kunja vidhum so that lord who is who is the lord who is who delights in the forest of rinda so actually uh, he is let him let us worship that lord so this which a godruma kan and kunja vidam as you notice is the chorus line for all the verses so there the meaning is given below over here so just worship that lord god the moon kanan is actually godruma kan and kunja vidum the moon of godrum so let's go back bhaja go yeah bhaja godrum kanana kunja vidum 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 let's recite all of it together you want to do it once and then we'll do it together afterwards अवतारवरम परिपूर्ण फलम परतत्वमिहात्म विलासमयम अवतारवरम परिपूर्ण फलम परतत्वमिहात्म विलासमयम व्रजदामरसं बुद्धिगुप्तरसं भज गोद्रुम कानन कुंज विदुम भज तामर सांबुदि गुप्तर संभज गोद्रुम कानन कुंज विदुम सो व्हेन द लॉर्ड अपीयर्स इन दिस वर्ल्ड ही अपीयर्स sometimes almost as if he is like an ordinary person so this is the spiritual level of reality and this is the material level of reality and so at this spiritual level the lord resides eternally he is always there now from there sometimes he descends to the world so the avatar avatar literally it means the one who descends avatariti avatar so sometimes avatar is translated as descent sometimes as incarnation now many times <coughs> when terms from one language are translated to another language some of the subtleties or nuances are lost so the word incarnation basically came in the english vocabulary from the christian context where jesus is considered the incarnation of christ and in that there is the word karna 
Karna is like carnal desires or carnivorous foods. So Karna basically means flesh. So incarnation literally means to come in flesh. Like reincarnation means to again come in a fleshly or a material body. So in that sense, incarnation is not an accurate word. Why is that? We lose our body. Sorry? God doesn't come in flesh, he is a spiritual God. Yes, <coughs> Krishna comes ajopisa navyatma bhutana mishwarupisa prakritim swamadishthaya. Krishna says, I manifest by my own nature in 4.6. So, so in that sense, it's not an accurate word. Now the word incarnation also has a non-literal meaning. The Prabhupada used incarnation, but the Prabhupada immediately clarified what it means. So when we talk about the avatar, um, there is also, especially in our tradition, there is the word archavatar. Archavatar is what? The deity form. Mm -hmm. Then there is the yuga avatar. Now of course, in Sanatana Goswami's Lagu Bhagavatamrit, he gives an elaborate analysis of different kinds of avatars. But the key principle is the Lord descends from the spiritual domain to the material domain. You know, here we can remove the screen. You know, like the other participants don't need to be seen. Everybody will see it. Okay. So the example that is given is that say there are clouds in the sky. Hmm. Now, the clouds may be there in the sky, but sometimes the clouds come down as rains. The clouds are like the Lord in the spiritual world. Hmm. The rains are like the avatar. Hmm. Now, when the avatar comes, the rains often come where we are. The rains come everywhere. Hmm. But the rains are not always there. The rains come and they go. Then there is a well. This doesn't look like a well. So there is a well. So this well, so this avatar is like the Yuga avatar. Now the well is the Archa avatar. The well or we could have a lake. Hmm? We will come back to this metaphor a little later. So, that means water is accumulated over there and water is available even when the rain stops. So, like that, the Lord's mercy is available at a particular time when He descends. But He is also available later through other manifestations. That is the avatar. So, He descends to this world from the spiritual law. Now this is the divine descent. Now like the word karma became popular in mainstream western language maybe 20-30 years ago. The word avatar has become popular in the last 10 years. <laughs> there, there is the idea of a digital avatar. You know, everybody has their avatar in social media. Hmm? They had the avatar movie also. So the idea is what? Like there is some kind of transposition, some kind of moving from one domain to another domain. So from the physical domain to the digital domain. So what is our manifestation? So that's the idea of avatar. So now what is the purpose of the Lord's descent? We will come, come to that later. But here it is described that the Lord has descended. Avatar varam and paripurna falam. So he is a complete manifestation. The word Paripurna is used in many places. The word, it means total completeness. See, whenever somebody seeks a relationship, there are two reasons for that relationship. Is to seek completeness. One is I feel, incom I feel incomplete, so I need someone in my life. And therefore, we seek a relationship. But there's, and that's the normal way we human beings seek relationships. But the Lord, Eko Bahusyam, this is His reason for seeking relationships is different. It is not to seek completeness, but to share completeness. He is Himself complete and He wants to share that completeness with others. Like suppose I don't have food, 
then I go to someone. You know, can you cook for me? Can you serve me some food? I go to a hotel somewhere. So I am going because I need something. But suppose I have so much food that I can't eat all of it. Then I go out to find someone to share the food with. So in both cases, somebody else is being sought. But the underlying dynamic is very different. So when the Lord descends to this world, Paripoorna Phalam. He is complete in himself. Om Purna Madha Purna Madha. That Purna Tua. He is complete. He is not coming here because of any material sense of incompleteness. And then, when he comes here, so what is he doing over here? It is Paratattva. He still remains the supreme reality. It is not that he becomes, when he comes to this world, he becomes a conditioned reality. It is he remains fully transcendent. So, he is the Paratattva and he remains the Paratattva. Now, this is important to understand because many times there are various ways, there are some concepts which are very common across the broad Vedic tradition. So, for example, the word, concept of avatar is very common. Mm -hmm. So, what happens is this concept of avatar is interpreted differently by different people. Mm -hmm. So, in the Advaitic tradition, mm, that is the tradition family coming from Chaitanya, from Shankaracharya. So what he says is that the only ultimate reality is Brahman. And then, when the Brahman comes in contact with Sattva, that leads to Ishwara. And that Ishwara comes as Avatar. They consider that it is, he is also contaminated. Although, less contaminated. When that Brahman links with Rajas, then there is the Jiva. And then the Brahman becomes covered by Tamas, there is the Prakriti. So, this is their idea. So, they consider Avatar is presently not the Paradattva. The Avatar is contaminated. But, that is not the Vaishnava understanding. That is not the Gita's teaching. That is not the Bhagavatam teaching. Paratattva is still the supreme reality. And what does he come here for? Atma Vilasamayam. So the Lord comes, the avatar has two purposes. He offers us a trailer. <laughs> now what is the trailer? Sorry? It's a short. <laughs> short preview. I appreciate how all of you are pretending to be ignorant. <laughs> well, we surprised we don't have to celebrate ignorance as a proof of our transcendence. <laughs> so, trailer is like a short description, a very attractive description. So, when the Lord comes over here, He displays His pastimes. And those pastimes are like the trailer of the movie that is going on eternally in the spiritual world. And when we watch the trailer, we become inspired to actually, I want to see the whole movie. We want to rise to the spiritual world. And the Lord offers us a trailer. His pastime. So, Ihatma Vilasamayam. In many ways, if we will see the Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastimes, that was a time when India was under Islamic rule and all. so many things were happening at a political level. But Mahaprabhu only occasionally interacts with the political reality of his times. His focus is on simply displaying the divine exchange of love between him and his devotees. Or rather, he's playing the role of a devotee. So it is between him and those who are following him, centered on the Lord, centered on Lord Krishna. But so this is a trailer. And essentially, when the Lord comes, there are two broad purposes. So, if you consider the verses 4.7 to 4.10, this is where the purpose of the Lord's descent is described. So, 4.7 and 8, they talk about establishing dharma. Dharma samsthapanarthaya sambhavami yuge yuge. And then after that, 4.9 and 10, they talk about bhakti. 
So now dharma is not a religion per se. It is basically order, like in law and order. Krishna says, those who are disruptive people, I stop them. And those who are who are law abiding, those who are good people, paritrana is how I protect them. I empower them. So now dharma, it is mandatory. Law and order is not a matter of choice. I don't I, I don't like to follow the traffic rules. I won't follow the traffic rules. And if you don't follow the traffic rules, those who those who implement the traffic rules will follow you. <laughs> <laughs> they will catch you. <laughs> so order is not a matter of choice. But bhakti is voluntary. Bhakti cannot be imposed. And that's why Krishna is saying, those who are attracted to my pastimes. Janma karma chameni devya evam yo vetti tattvataha tyaktva deham punar janma naiti ma veti sarajuna So that is his ultimate purpose. You see both these purposes are related. But one purpose is implemented even in enforced. The other purpose is more inspired. It is something which not everybody will practice. But those who want they have that opportunity for them. So, when we consider Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in one sense, his primary focus is in establishing this bhakti. He does establish the Yuga Dharma of chanting, but that is centered on bhakti. When the Lord comes as a Kshatriya, the Lord focuses on bringing about political change. But when the Lord comes as a Brahmana, he doesn't focus on that. So, he is primarily given a trailer to inspire bhakti. So, now, Ihatma Vilasamayam. So he is exhibiting his own personal pastimes. So quite often, when the other avatars come, like when Buddha comes or Kalki comes, they are, they are fulfilling the purpose of avatar. But in those cases, you know, fighting and destroying miscreants, that is the mission of Kalki. Now that is not what happens in the spiritual world. And Prabhupada asks, are there demons in the spiritual world? Prabhupada said there are rumors of demons. <laughs> so what he meant is that there are there is sometimes talk of demons to sometimes create some excitement, some anxiety, and thereby to have some tension. See now generally if there is no tension, then there is no attention. <laughs> For example, say if in a class you fully know what the speaker is going to speak next. <laughs> You know, because the speakers speak the same thing all the time. Then, no, there is not much attention about that. Okay, you spoke of this. Hey, I didn't expect this point. What is going to go on over here? So when there is some tension, there is a push-pull going on. And that's why there is a tension. So there are, there are, there are not demons in the spiritual world, but there is a rumor of demons. So, so when we consider, say, avatars like Kalki or Buddha, they are not, dis what they are doing in this world is different from what they are doing in the spiritual world. There is no ihatma vilasamayam. So this is for avatars like Ram, Krishna and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That what is being done over here is the same as what is actually being done over there. So now he is saying that, now. so what is exactly going on here? It is displaying the Brajadham, Rasam Buddhi. That in the in Vrindavan, there is an ocean of the emotion of devotion. So, rasa ambudhi, the concept of rasa is a very interesting concept. Mm -hmm. Probably before you were introduced to bhakti, the only time we heard the word rasa was uh, was uh, mang ma amras or bangaroos or uh, sugar cane juice or something like that. Or is it rasagulla? <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> Rasmalai, okay. So, so rasa has a particular connotation. Like something associated with juice. Something like that. Something sweet, flavory, juicy. So, Prabhupada sometimes translates as mellow. So now, rasa basically it refers to refined emotion. It's emotion, but it's not just ordinary emotion. So, rasa is experienced by those who have some refinement of their consciousness. So, for example, 
say if somebody is doing a bharatanatyam dance if some now they are depicting krishna leela and say some beautiful female dancer is depicting krishna leela dancing now somebody who is not refined you now all that they might see is oh this is an attractive woman and all that they feel is some physical attraction so there could be the refinement of emotion hmm? at a basic level there might be just lust but if there is a little more say appreciation of the dance oh this person is dancing so well so there might be more aesthetic appreciation hmm? aesthetic appreciation of what of the dancing ability dancing is uh, no dancing is not easy like when, uh, so because it's also a skill people have to have a particular kind of grace in their body of course everybody can dance but some people when they start dancing people wonder when they going to stop dancing <laughs> <laughs> so when will this trailer end <laughs> <laughs> yeah so now this person is expert at dancing so there is some appreciation but then if there's further refinement of consciousness then say they they're not just appreciating dancing ability they are also seeing okay this person is depicting krishna leela and they know the krishna past time and they say okay what is the expression being depicted over here what is this expression what does this stand for you know oh, i'm going to hand it oh this is for maybe a maybe a bucket maybe a, a bowl or a container on the top of the head the gopis are what is this So what happens is it's com- almost a complete different universe being opened. So the same aesthetic appreciation can be of centered on remembrance of Krishna. So rasa is basically refined emotion. Vibhuta bhagvatam rasamalayam. So oh, rasamalayam means. Now, Prabhupada says that Radha Krishna past times, somebody might just take them as mundane male-female interactions. But if you become a rasika, then we understand that there's so much more over there that it's there's a practical nothing mundane about it. So, Vrindavan is the abode of refined emotion, not just the abode; it's an ocean of rasambudi. And even among those refined emotions, there are the top most refined emotions. the supremely refined emotion so gupta rasam now the word gupta has distinct connotations and you know there is sometimes it's translated as secret sometimes it's translated as hidden confidential or hidden so gupta is hidden so now if you consider confidential So actually, there is a difference between secret and private. Hmm? The secret means you don't tell it to anyone, but private means it doesn't concern you. Say, for example, if there is some event going on at home, uh, at our home, and then at a particular home, say, and then maybe the wife wants to talk with the husband. The husband is talking to some guests. Can I have a private word with you? Now, it is not necessarily that secret. But if there may be something about domestic affairs or whatever, some practical thing is there, it's not relevant for anyone. So it's not that this is meant to be hidden. <coughs> That's it is not necessarily to be hidden, but it is not relevant for others. So generally, when Krishna uses the word guhya, he is using it more in the sense of not that Krishna deliberately wants to hide it from us. See, this won't be relevant for you. Yeah, once I when I was introduced to bhakti. I started sharing your bhakti with my relatives. So my uncle, I told him, he said, "I believe in God. He is happy there. I am happy here." <laughs> <laughs> so many people may not feel the relevance of God at all. <laughs> so the idea is that uh, Krishna says, "Don't thrust, thrust what is confidential on those for whom it is not relevant." they just not comprehend it and they will try to quickly understand something see something is complex and you try to quickly understand it most likely you are going to misunderstand <coughs> it it's like there's some complicated passage supposed to be read and you decide you know that i'll read it one minute and one minute what you will gather out of it is something which will take one hour to clear the misconception of it <laughs> what is it <laughs> so so 
it is gupta rasam that gupta rasa is the the love of the gopis for krishna especially the love of radharani for krishna so there are many aspects of what is gupta about it but specifically i'll just quickly mention one of those aspects see when krishna goes away from vrindavan radharani and the gopis they experience immense agony in separation from krishna and in one sense this agony doesn't seem to be like happiness at all and yet that is considered to be the highest state of krishna consciousness why is that because in bhakti there might be agony there might be ecstasy but the foundation is remembrance of krishna this is at the spiritual level Now, at the material level, there might be happiness and there might be distress, but the foundation is what? Forgetfulness of Krishna. Hmm. So the thing is that at the material level, what is experienced is considered for the soul to be like poison, because essentially we are forgetting who we are. So happiness at the material level. is like it is like sweet poison hmm? and distress is like bitter poison now in one sense sweet poison is more dangerous because <laughs> you just keep drinking it more and keep seeking it more but that doesn't mean we have to be deliberately miserable <laughs> the point is that the happiness of this world can also point us towards the spiritual happiness but for most people they get caught in it. Now remembrance of Krishna is like nectar. Sukhataram aparam na ja tu jaane hari charana smaranam rutte na tulyam. Remembrance of the Lord like nectar. So now when there is agony of separation, in one sense you could say it's like bitter nectar, hmm? and ecstasy is like sweet nectar. Now whether it is whether it is bitter or sweet, that is the immediate experience. but fundamentally it's nectar uh, that is at the spiritual level so now the gopis could reject krishna you know we gave up everything for you and you gave us up why should we care for you we will we'll give you up but the gopis don't do that although they experience immense agony because of separation from krishna they still mat prananathas to save na para that last verse of shikshashtakam is spoken in the mood of radharani by chaitanya mahaprabhu you are the lord of my life mat prananath and na para no one will ever else be the lord so that is actually unconditional love generally whenever there is love we we give something to the other person we expect something from the other person so the gopis in one sense they give everything to krishna and krishna just gives them up and goes away but there is every reason to abandon that love but they don't so there is being in the state of this bitter nectar is demonstrating their unconditional love for krishna most people will think of such unconditional love as unwanted love <laughs> i don't want this or this it But this is where Krishna's special position comes in. That well, Krishna lives in Vrindavan, but actually Krishna lives in the hearts of those who live in Vrindavan. Krishna enters deeper into the hearts of the gopis, and therefore, when they are away from him, they are remembering him even more and more. So this is not very easy to understand. That it is actually exalted level of devotion. So Gupta Rasam. so it is this highest love that the, the the level of selflessness the level of the unconditional nature of love of the gopis for krishna it is that love that shri chaitanya mahaprabhu has come to demonstrate so such is the lord vaj godruma kan and one who is the moon of godru kunja let us let us worship that lord so let us recite this verse once again and then we will Move on to the other words. You want to wait? Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
बट हियर महाप्रभु इज महा औषधि दान परम ही जस्ट गिविंग इट फ्रीली दैट इज इज चैरिटी शॉवर ऑफ टीयर्स is coming from his eyes seeing the distress of others that is his extraordinary compassion patitartadayatrasumurtidharam 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 टुगेदर लॉर्ड मिशन एट वन लेवल इज जिस डिस्प्ले इज पास टाइम्स but while he is displaying his past times he is also addressing the situation that is there in this world so now kaliyuga is highlighted in many different ways as being extremely dangerous and degraded now why is it so much degraded what exactly is degraded about kaliyuga is that you know, we all as human beings <laughs> there is a natural search for happiness within us and in the past ages this search for happiness it was gradually directed upwards this is the path of dharma or punya where people live piously and gradually they get elevated see across the world certainly in the vedic tradition but beyond also there is some understanding that there is ultimate reality that there is there is god and that we need to live in harmony with god in the past death was very much a evident reality for everyone <coughs> although there was prosperity although there was uh, well being but you know, the kind of comforts that we have created in the world today it often uh, sedates us it's like a sedative which makes us forget the reality that life in this world is temporary so but in the past people were aware of that more or less 
They said there's a focus on something higher. So there was a path of dharma, and most people, to varying degrees, they followed the path of dharma. No. Now there was also the path of moksha. The moksha is ultimately culminates in bhakti. This was followed by few people. It's more like a rapid advancement. Mm -hmm. And of course, there was the path of papa, mm -hmm. which is again few people. There were always people who were going to be like this, <coughs> but this was followed by few people. Mm -hmm. But in today's world, so this was overall in the past. But in Kaliyuga, what has happened is, if we consider this path of moksha and the path to swarga, now this, both of these to some extent, are largely declared as imaginary. Most people think that there is no other world. And see the people who say there is no such thing as a spiritual world. Those people take the digital world very seriously. <laughs> Isn't it? <coughs> they, they actually get completely immersed. The way people watch movies, play video <coughs> games, get caught in characters. And there are these comic cons and all those things. People actually wear the kind of costumes of those characters. They act like those characters. So you know, people create another world. So we had, we rejected the reality of the spiritual world. But then what has happened is, if there is no idea of a higher world, then we start seeking pleasure in this world itself. And we start seeking pleasure in this world, in this path. This is unfortunately what most people follow. And the problem in Kali Yuga is twofold. There is always people who are going to do wrong and degrade themselves. But in Kali Yuga, this particular path is intellectually rationalized. That means, oh, pleasure is what, is, this is what life is meant for. Why should there be any restrictions at all? You know, this old-fashioned religion and morality, it's all stifling. It's all suffocating. It's not what we need. So, I was in... Uh, uh, I was in California, and there, it is a Western outreach program. And uh, there, the Western couple had come there talking with me. So, I said, asked, the prove what he is doing and then he asked another he says I am a stay at home dog mom I'm a what? I am a stay at home dog mom so I said dog mom I said, is that a real thing? he said you know that means I have a puppy and the puppy is like my baby and I am a stay at home dog mom so so now now the way the world has become she said I googled and it seems to be a cool thing there are people who are stay at home dog moms and stay at home cat moms also. <laughs> so, now, if somebody wants to have pets, that's that's up to them. That, that's I'm not criticizing that. But the point I'm making over here is that people think, you know, why should we have children? Now, there's no need for children. In fact, there's a whole antenatal movement which is, you know, that the planet is burdened with so much uh, of a human carbon footprint. So why bring another human being? Well, the planet is not burdened because of the number of human beings. The planet is burdened because of the level of consciousness of the human beings. So if we can bring up a child and bring it up to be bring the child to be virtuous, that's a great society to humanity. So anyway, the point I'm making is this is just one example. Of uh, this is not a you may say it's not a very serious thing, but I'm giving the example of things being intellectually rationalized. That that which is so having a pet and choosing not to have children and thinking that we are being virtuous for not having children. <coughs> that is something which is uh, not so advisable. It is there's uh, there are all kinds of addictions that are always been there in society. But now quite often, say, what is wrong is glamorized. In movies when there are some explicit scenes, they are called as bold scenes. Now what does it mean? 
the opposite of bold is what cowardly that means if somebody is not exposing their skin they are cowardly it's a subtle change of a subtle use of language but there's a there's a value system that is being changed over there. so in kaliyuga sin is intellectually rationalized and then it is also unfortunately socially glamorized glamorized means see in the past somebody was a wrong doer that person would recognize you know maybe what i'm doing is not so good maybe i should stay away i should do it discreetly but now what's wrong with it this is what i want to do and this is what i will do it becomes like that so this makes the path down it becomes like a expressway on which everybody <coughs> will go so for example in today's world uh, meat eating intoxication gambling unrestrained sexuality these are just the natural path that everybody will follow because that is the way society has become arranged and that is dangerous so kali kukura mudgara bhavadara so this is the rabbit dog so when mahaprabhu comes through his shiksha he counters this he emphasizes that there is a higher world not only is there a higher world but that that higher world is filled with higher happiness and he offers harinam maha aushadha so what happens when we chant the sare krishna mantra essentially it elevates our consciousness so much that we start experiencing higher happiness so this maha aushadha it we started at talk talk about rasa being refined emotion so by the chanting of the holy names by the glorification of the lord our capacity for emotion starts becoming refined so what the hari naam when you say hari naam is like a medicine hari naam as a medicine essentially what it does is it refines our emotions we start experiencing subtler sweeter emotions that capacity is something which deeply uplifts us and that is how chaitanya mahaprabhu he gives this particular medicine and whom does he give to he gives to every one he gives to uh, especially as chaitanya mahaprabhu traveled all over india as new ditan prabhu he wanted to him to go to all the places which are especially fallen and shri prabhu pad came to america so prabhu pad embodied this compassionate mood of chaitanya mahaprabhu Where, where he offered this dana param, this charity of love of God, by which our tastes will be transformed. The when we chant the holy names, it is not just a religious ritual. We'll find that if we practice the chanting of the holy names, our the things that we seek pleasure in, the things that we find pleasure in, that itself will change. So sometimes what happens when we chant? we think that the holy name itself should give me pleasure and yes it will this guys kirtans it gives us pleasure sometimes as japa also we get some pleasure but more important than when you talk about the holy name it is a source of pleasure but it is at our levels we can say it is sometimes but but it is more importantly the source of transforming <laughs> our source of pleasure what actually gives me happiness the holy name changes that and we'll start finding the things the things which we are craving for earlier and we found them irresistible oh we find you know there's nothing nothing there in the so much maybe if we are young and we want to experience something new we may go and experience But then after some time, we'll realize, you know, there is there's not, nothing really over here. We will realize that soon, and we will connect with Krishna. And it is this that he used profusely. Shri Prabhu Pa demonstrated this dramatic transformation when he actually he actually came to the West and transformed those who were completely caught in the counterculture. As he said, those here hippies, he made them happy. So that same. mission of shetanam hapu is still very much alive and active and 
that so he has come to enable every one of us to transform what we see as our source of pleasure and that is the mercy that we can pray to mahaprabhu for when we celebrate god purnima and he lord i think of this and this and this as source of pleasure but you know all those are just tiny sources of pleasure please help me realize that it is your name it is your glorification tvadvirya gayan mahamrutam agna chitta it is your glorification it is the source of the supreme so this is the blessing of you chaitanya mahaprabhu so that brings us to the transformation that will come inside us we'll discuss that and we conclude but let's recite this together once again ಕರಮೋದ್ಗರಭಾವಧರಂ ಅಭಿಲಾಷಯಂ ತದ್ ಅಭೇದಧಿಯಂ ಸೊ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಮೆನಿ ಮೆನಿ ಡಿಸೈರ್ಸ್ ಬಟ್ ಅಭಿಲಾಷಯಂ ದಟ್ ಸಿಲೆಕ್ಟ್ ಯುವರ್ ಆಸ್ಪಿರೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಸೊ ಮಚ್ ರಿಜೆಕ್ಟ್ ಯುವರ್ ಆಸ್ಪಿರೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಆಸ್ ಚಯಂ ಸಿಲೆಕ್ಟ್ ಸೊ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಡಿಸೈರ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವಿ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಡಿಸೈರ್ ಮೆನಿ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಬಟ್ ಸಿಲೆಕ್ಟ್ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಟ್ರೂಲಿ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ತದ್ ಅಭೇದಧಿಯಂ ದರ್ ಇಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ದರ್ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಬಿ ಮೆಟೀರಿಯಲ್ ಡಿಸೈರ್ಸ್ ವಿ ವಿ ಪುಟ್ ದೆಮ್ ಅಸೈಡ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ಲಿ ಡಿಸೈರ್ಸ್ thinking that the world th- world things will be the source of happiness abhedhiyam is the mentality which thinks that we will become god mm-hmm. now when i first heard this philosophy that we are god my first thought was if i am god the world is in big trouble <laughs> <laughs> you know uh, i'm struggling to manage my own life If I have to manage the whole world, <laughs> the world is really in big trouble. So, abhedhiyam. This is particular mentality. And then, while we are serving the Lord, okay, we'll just recite this. I'm going to recite this. Abhilashachayam tadabhedhiyam Abhilashachayam tadabhedhiyam ಅಭಿಲಾಷಯಂ ತದೇದಿಯಂ ಅಭಿಲಾಷಯಂ ತದೇದಿಯಂ ಸೊ ವೈಲ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಓಕೆ ಸೊ ವಿ ಡಿಸೈಡ್ ಐ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ವಾಂಟ್ ಫೋಕಸ್ ಆನ್ ಸೈಡಿಂಗ್ ದ ಲಾಡ್ ವಿ ಗಿವ್ ಅಪ್ ಮಂಡೆ ಡಿಸೈರ್ಸ್ ವಿ ಗಿವ್ ಅಪ್ ದ ಇಂಪರ್ಸನಲ್ ಕನ್ಸೆಪ್ಷನ್ ಬಟ್ ದೆನ್ ಸ್ಟಿಲ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಕೋರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಸಮಟೈಮ್ಸ್ ಗುಡ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ವಿಲ್ ಹ್ಯಾಪನ್ ಸಮಟೈಮ್ಸ್ ಬ್ಯಾಡ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ವಿಲ್ ಹ್ಯಾಪನ್ ದಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ನೇಚರ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಅಶುಭಂ ಚ ಶುಭಂ ಚ ತ್ಯಜ ಸರ್ವಮ ಇದಂ ಸೊ ashubham to shubham don't get caught oh this is good this is bad like we are on a path just keep moving straight towards the lord sometimes bad may happen tej sarva just don't bother about those conceptions so is it meant to be in this line or the next line how will the meter come not seeing ashubham to shubham cha tej sarva midam ashubham to shubham cha tej sarva midam is it the right meter or wrong I think idam should be in the next line. Yeah, right? in the next one. Idam, but idam anukulataya, we are saying when I am. Yeah. So anukulataya. So rather than worrying that oh this is this is this is good, this is bad, just focus on what is favorable for bhakti. Okay, how can this situation be favorable for my bhakti? So how can this situation be an opportunity for me to serve the Lord? So when Prabhupada his business didn't work out. No, he tried again and again and again. It didn't work out. Prabhupada could have said, "You could have been bitter. I'm doing this for you. Why is this not happening?" But anukulatay, anukulatay. Yeah, please say, my dear Lord, you are always dear to me, dear to me, you are dear to me. So I'll see this. You don't want me to serve you as a business person. You want me to serve you as a as your direct teacher, direct teacher. So that is what I do. So a devotee means. we don't look at things from what is materially good or bad materially auspicious or inauspicious we see how can i see the situation as favorable for my devotion as 
something by which I can go closer to Krishna. So, you want to recite this? Right. Is it possible? Which one? The, uh, the second, second and third. Ashubham. Vilasha chayam tadabeda diyam ashubham chashubham chatyaja sarvam idam. Vilasha chayam tadabeda diyam ashubham chashubham chatyaja sarvam idam. Anukulataya priya sevanaya. 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 Bajagodru makana na kunja vidum. Baja go you talk about you know, what is the transformation that we seek now. At, at one level, the transformation that comes through bhakti. Mm -hmm. At one level, it is automatic. In the sense that, <coughs> just by the chanting of the holy names, our inclination or infatuation with worldly things will decrease. That's just a natural consequence. Vasuteve Bhagwati Bhakti Yoga Prayojitaha Chanetya Ashvairagyam Jnanam Chidahetukam So what happens is, when we practice Bhakti, that gives a Bhakti Pareshanubhava. We get an experience of Krishna. And once we get this experience of Krishna, the result of that is, all other experiences they become relatively speaking unimportant insignificant viraktir anyatra cha so not that we neglect them not that we reject our responsibilities but the point is we are not so agitated by them but I want this to happen I can't bear this happening no. in the world things will happen by their own course so we are able to be steady so that at one level this will be automatic. Just by the <coughs> practice of bhakti, say if we come to a temple, we have a nice darshan, we participate in a, participate in a wonderful festival, and whatever ups and downs are going on in our life, we will find that we won't we get so agitated by them. We just become calmer. Not only at that time we become calm, but later on for a few days, when we go and face life's ups and downs also, we are still steadier. It's like life, life will always have these ups and downs. Now, for people who are not connected with Krishna, it's like the up, they really go up, and the down, they totally go down. <laughs> so, but for us, as we keep practicing bhakti more and more, <coughs> we start becoming steadier and steadier. <coughs> little up, little down, but not much. So, we start becoming steadier. So, this, at one level, will naturally happen to the practice of bhakti. But another level, it can also be intentional. Intentional means done with our intention. It's like say, uh, somebody, somebody is very sick. They take the proper treatment, they will become healthy. Say somebody was, uh, had their arm fractured or something like that. Now, if they are taking the proper treatment, they are becoming healthy, naturally. But along with their becoming healthier, they also need to start exercising their arm. Okay, maybe lift it a little bit. Now, their exercising is not the main component that is healing them. It's the medicine. But their exercising is also important. If they're not exercising, then the medicine might be curing their arm, but their mobility may not return. So like that, so for example, when we are recovering from a fracture, there is an automatic thing ha which happens through the medicine, but there is also a conscious thing which has to be done in the form of exercise. 
so for us we can also consciously try that when our we get attracted to worldly things over a period of time automatically the attractions will go down but when those attractions come you know this is favorable to bhakti anukul kaya but don't anukul kaya let me try to keep a distance from it let me try to say no to it and in bhakti we focus not so much on saying no to the things of the world but we focus more on saying yes to it so by mahaprabhu's mercy do we have so many ways in which we can connect with krishna so many ways in which we can practice bhakti so many ways so many services are there to be done so many pastimes are there to be really heard in the relish so many multifarious activities are there so i met one devotee recently he was he was a christian monk and he actually was a christian preacher so he it is designed designed courses for for teaching the bible so for many years teaching the bible was his profession and chanting hari krishna was his personal devotion <laughs> so he is doing that and finally he came out he came out so he had a facebook page called thomas hari bol <laughs> <laughs> that is an anonymous name <laughs> so he was telling me that no i was teaching the bible but when i started chanting hari krishna living the bible became so much easier i knew that you should be doing this but in the christian tradition with all due respects to jesus there is not much of a sadhana that is given okay you go to a temple go to church once a week participate in mass it is good but there is no tangible sadhana that is given so there is no practical tool by which we can transform our desires so this we make some effort to transform our desires and we'll see that there will be like a magical multiplier effect we make a little effort and things may not change dramatically in our outer world but in our world there will be a dramatic change is fight against a little desire uh, fight a little against a desire but fight more for serving the lord think of you know how can i fill my consciousness so prabhupada says devotional service bhakti translated as devotional service so devotion is what fills our consciousness internally and service is what fills our day or our time externally so in this way if we focus on filling our consciousness internally with devotional remembrance and externally our day with service then we'll find that this this higher it is this param drishtwa that will naturally come and then is bhaja godruma kanana kunja vidhu this will become the natural flow of our heart towards the lord that is what we all can pray for on the occasion of of shethan mahapur's appearance that is mercy bring about a natural flow of our hearts aspirations towards krishna and his service so i'll summarize we discuss based on this song three things what was the first identity, identity. so we discuss this is the lord himself he has come from the spiritual domain to the material domain as an avatar so avatar is more of a descent and the descent is for the purpose of at one level it is dharma but it is also bhakti so especially the lord comes and gives us a trailer of his past times to inspire us to come towards him so now when he comes he ha- so we discuss what especially what was the gupta part of his past time is the total the unconditional nature of the love that can the unconditional theme comes in teja shubham cha shubham cha teja sarvam idam that for us krishna is not want to reject us the way the gopis rejected but for our level the way we practice and practice unconditional bhakti is krishna whether good or bad happens in my life i am your servant you are my lord so that is what we can try to do so then we discuss about the intention of the lord the intention of the lord is to is to war off to fight off the toxic influence of kali the rabid dog of kali so 
why is this considered rabid because while there is wrong was always there but this path down of papa is both rationalized and glamorized that's why more and more people just go down this path and the maha mahaushadhi the mahaushad that he gives what does it do it it gives us a taste but it also is a transformer of taste and sometimes when we don't realize that it is a transformer of taste we may just feel that oh i don't get any taste in the chanting of the holy names even if we don't get taste if we just chant we'll find a taste in our rest of our life will be changed and then lastly we discuss this transformation this transformation that bhakti bhakti transformation that happens that is about giving up other desires and just seeing everything <coughs> how can bhakti transformation that means we see not things as good bad good and bad will keep happening we don't see this vision we see favorable unfavorable and even what is bad we can see how it is favorable for my bhakti favorable to bhakti and that way we can stay connected and this is something which both happens automatically and also intentionally so recovery will happen through the medicine but if we consciously try then it can happen even more and bhakti is about not rejecting but it's more about filling we fill our consciousness with devotional remember with devotion and we fill our life with service and in this way mahaprabhu's magical mercy can transform all our lives thank you very much shri gauran the mahaprabhu ki jai gaur purnima mahamahotsav ki jai shri chaitanya charan prabhu ki jai do we have time for questions yeah, sure. any questions or comments it's a very nice class for me thank you so like uh, in uh, kaliyuga you know like like it, what he says like it's kukra like a like a mad animal like it was there so whenever we deal with a mad animal or a mad people it is really very vigorous like we will use very hard uh, way to have to give medicines or anything but uh, but how mahaprabhu is using is very soft and is like a devotee he just more merciful to uh, contact with the people and all that. so it is really looks so contrary to so how such mercy will transform to that level so that's what i was thinking like if if, if such such extreme okay it's to be yes so the way people are right now how will even the lord's mercy reach them uh, yes there has to be is that a strong message requ- delivery required well in every society you know, we could go into the value system of modernity and how seen the past one of the major values in society was duty or responsibility that like for everyone i am a part of society i am part of family i am part of a community i am part of country i have a part to play that was a primary value but in the present the we are talking about the primary value over here it's not duty or responsibility it is autonomy you know i am my own person <coughs> i want to do what i want to do now this doesn't necessarily mean people will be irresponsible even people can autonomously choose responsibility but the primary value is autonomy the primary value is you cannot impose anything on me so we have to recognize the ethos of the times so if for example in the past marriage was more as a duty or responsibility it is you know most people never got to choose their part it is like social arrangement political arrangement whatever that's how it and it is a responsibility to do it but today it's very much a matter of autonomy you know i'll make my choice and i if it doesn't work i'll opt out of the choice so in every area autonomy is very important so for example feminism emphasizes autonomy for women 
Now, women should make their own choices. They want a career, they should have a career. That's fine. That's true. But it is not that men were suppressing women for thousands of years. Even men, before 300, 400 years, men also didn't have much autonomy. You know, whatever, whatever uh, in India there was a ca uh, varna, caste system was there. In the West there was a class system. You know, whatever class you were born in, that's the class kind of job you'll get. So autonomy was not there for anyone, not completely not there, but that was not even considered that important a value. Mm -hmm. And yeah, men, men themselves, most of the, only by 17th century when industrialization started, that actually men got autonomy. In the sense that men got some options, okay, I don't want to have this job, I can choose something else. So, and within 200 years women also have got. Mm. Now children want autonomy from their parents also. And that can be problematic, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> so, there is this, uh, in California they made, I don't know how, it's in Connecticut, but in California they have a rule that if a child thinks that, you know, actually I'm not a, I'm not a girl, I'm a boy. They can actually take hormonal treatment and do surgery without even informing their parents. So, you know, that level of autonomy from the parents is completely unhealthy. Mm, it's dangerous actually. But anyway, the point I'm making is, autonomy is very much valuable. So autonomy can also become dangerous at one level. But the thing is, we cannot completely go against the ethos of the world. Mm. That's why Mahaprabhu's mood as Channa Avatar is actually very appropriate this Kali Yuga. Mahaprabhu doesn't say that I am God and you surrender to me. Mahaprabhu says, this is how we all can find ultimate happiness. Mahaprabhu is demonstrating Bhakti. So we, although people need urgently, we cannot impose it on others. We can only propose it to others. So sharing of devotion, in fact nowadays, I am one of the editors for Back to Godhead, so from several years, we, not, we stopped using the word preaching also. Because <laughs> preaching sounds very preachy. <laughs> like I am sitting a holier, somebody, the preacher is sitting holier than thou, high up and issuing dictates for everyone else to follow. That's not the mood of Shri Prabhupada, that's not the mood of our mood, but still the word comes. So we use the word sharing bhakti. And when we are sharing, it's not meant to be an imposition. Hmm? That won't work. It's actually first, there is a proposition. You know, there's, a, there's a different way of looking at life. There's a different way of looking, living. And then, after the proposition, you know, there is inspiration. And you, not only this is a different way of living, but you can live this way. So the more we present bhakti in this way, not not so much prescriptive that you do this, but descriptive. This is what I do. This is why I do it. And then we inspire others. That's what will reach people. And more and more, various traditions, other religious traditions are also adopting this ethos only. That you know you cannot be very vertical in outreach. It will be much more horizontal. That's the ethos of the world. So the autonomy is very much emphasized. So you have to persuade people. And one advantage of bhakti is that you know, in today's world, if you consider that historically there are pre-modern times, then there are modern times, and now what they call is post-modern times. So in pre-modern times, the primary authority was scripture. Hmm. It is whether whichever religion it might be, then people followed scripture. In modern times, it was science as the primary authority. Now, in the post-modern times, the primary authority is experience. <coughs> if I experience something and it it is good, it feels good, it it brings adds value to my life, then I will do it. And this is where we have a big advantage in Mahaprabhu's processes, eminently experiential. So when we can just help people experience Krishna, then we can actually, we can help them take up bhakti in, in extraordinarily effective ways. So Prabhupada didn't just give classes, Prabhupada gave people experience of Krishna. Okay. Why did you lock the door, guys? Any last question before we stop? Yes, um, so you talked about devotion fills the heart and service fills the day and time. So the question is like, can there be devotion without service and service without devotion? 
ओके कैन देर बी डिवोशन विदाउट सर्विस एंड सर्विस विदाउट डिवोशन वेल इट इज पॉसिबल बट इट इज नॉट सस्टेनेबल से फॉर एग्जाम्पल समबडी माई नाउ इज पीपल जस्ट लाइक टू डू वॉलंटियर वर्क सो इन मेनी ऑफ आर टेम्पल्स इन इंडिया we have created like community service projects so many colleges schools they want students to do some community service work so you know maybe 50 hours in a semester you have to do some community service so they come to the temple and help in the gardening they come to the temple and maybe even help with social media whatever and they do that and then the temple is authorized to give them certificate that you did this service so now they are doing service they could go anywhere and do the service so they don't have much devotion they doing service and just by associating with devotees they are coming to the temple they are spending time with devotees so from that service so basically you could say there is service then there is devotional service and then there is pure devotional service so it's incremental steps krishna talks about this this is 12.8 this is 12.9 and 10 and this is 12.11 now quite often people will go step by step only so in one sense if somebody is only doing service without devotion then what is going to happen is okay if they never develop devotion then they will find some other form of service to do they feel okay let me go and do some humanitarian work let me do some let me do something else now can there be devotion without service well again <coughs> suppose somebody is sick and they are in bed they just can't do anything so they may not be able to do any service but still they can hear about krishna they can remember krishna they can pray to krishna that's possible but suppose somebody recovers and after recovering also they don't resume the service then the in that time the devotion will be there but unless the devotion is expressed it will not be sustained so over a period of time so yes it's possible in say it's possible sickness say for example <coughs> here it be possible volunteerism so we want to do volunteer work so in general from devotion there has to be some expression through some service and through service there needs to be some infusion of devotion that's when it will become sustained okay. thank you devotion without service is good it doesn't sense ah Well, it can sometimes you know some treasure is buried so deep that even the person forgets that I have a treasure. <laughs> <laughs> so like some people say, "Ki Bhagwan ka smaran, 24 घंटे चल रहा है." I'm always remembering the Lord. Why do we need to chant the Lord? And you chant, you you just chant and you fall asleep and you wake up and chant. भाव नहीं है. तो बोले भाव से जब करना चाहिए. It's true we should chant with devotion, but the problem is, ki it's not that bhav is going to manifest automatically. No, what comes automatically will also go automatically. <laughs> it like even in ordinary relations, you say people fall in love and then people fall out of love, <laughs> isn't it? So if you want to have a serious relationship, you cannot just be dependent on the emotion. There has to be some dedication. That's why the love is not just a noun; it's also a verb. So you can say devotion is also not just a noun. It's not just something we experience; it's also something that we cultivate. So, anushilanam. So yes, I mean, they have some devotion, but if they never express it through some service, then whether it will last for long. So, in one sense, you could say that is devotion without service is gupta in the sense that there is devotion hidden in everyone's heart. But it will not; it won't just stay unmanifest. It will often be directed towards other things. So thank you very much. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu ki jai. Gopad ki jai. Gaur bhakta bind ki jai. Dai gaur prema. Hari Hari bol. Thank you very much. Mahaprasad ek govinde. Mahaprasad ek govinde. Namo bhavani.